My name is Alicia Weinberger, and thanks for watching Debris Discs as Planetary Signpost from an observational perspective. I'm leaving all the theory to Mark Wyatt's talk, so please see that one as well. Before we go any further, let's define a debris disk. So this is a disk of material generated by the collisions or evaporation of planetesimals. That is its secondary material. The planetesimals, the exoplanetary analogs of asteroids and comets formed as part of the planet formation process, and they're still present in systems. So the presence of a debris disk signals that a star has gone at least as far as making, toward making planets as making small bodies. So these disks are best known for their dust contents, but they may also have gas, as we'll talk about later. So as you can imagine, it's sometimes not so easy to distinguish between primordial and debris disks, because there may be a time when there's still primordial material alongside second generation dust and gas being produced from planetesimals. Most of the disks that I'll be telling you about today are optically thin and have so little material that we don't know of processes that could keep that material around for the lifetimes of the stars. So we think that it must all be secondary. I'm not going to talk about the processes that remove dust and gas. I'm leaving that to the theory talk. So you'll have to take my word for it that we think this material is secondary. So let me give you a brief outline of this talk. I will discuss in part one, a little historical context for the solar system and the discovery of debris disks and talk about debris disk statistics and lifetimes. In part two, I'm gonna talk about imaging of disks and in particular, the sort of features that we look for to reveal the architectures of planetary systems. And in part three, I'll talk about some other aspects of disks that tell us about planetary system composition and formation. So that is a lot to talk about and I don't want you to have to watch this on two times speed. So here we go, we're going to find disks everywhere. So there are two main ways that we observe disks, and I'm going to illustrate this by showing you images of the zodiacal light in our own solar system. So the zodiacal light shows up as this triangle of light that comes up from the horizon, either after sunset or before sunrise. So the sun is below the horizon and we don't see its light directly, but its light is reflecting off of dust grains that are far enough away that they are above our horizon, and those dust grains are reflecting the light back to us. Of course, the ancients knew about the zodiacal light because they had nice dark skies. In particular, this picture was taken from the nice dark sky at Las Campanas Observatory, where I do a lot of my work. So scattered light is one of the two main ways in which we also study debris disks because the direction and albedo and polarization and other properties of scattered light can tell us something about the composition of the dust as well as its distribution and its geometry. So the second main way that we study debris disks is through their emission. So here, those same dust grains, which can scatter light, also absorb light from the central star and then heat up and re-emit infrared emission at whatever their characteristic temperature is. So this is an infrared astronomical satellite or IRS full sky image. And you can see that the most prominent feature is the galactic plane. So here is all the dust that's being lit up by star formation, young stars. Uh, but along the ecliptic, you see this blue uh, emission, which is that of the zodiacal dust. So this is color coded. IRS looked at 12, 25, 60, and 100 microns. And 12 microns is coded to blue, 100 microns to red. So you can see that the zodiacal light is primarily emitting at 12 microns. So it's warm, about 300 Kelvin. And that's because most of the dust in, that we see in our system is in the vicinity of the Earth at one to a few AU. There is dust that's generated in the Kuiper belt, but it's undetected in emission, or telescopically at all, actually. So the Zodi, as we call the zodiacal light, is very tenuous, but it has high surface area and then high infrared luminosity. So even though it's something like a trillionth of the mass of all the planets combined, it has high infrared luminosity. So we characterize the dustiness of debris disks by the ratio of their infrared luminosity to that of the host star. So for the Zodi, that's about 10 to the minus seven. And we think that there's another 10 to the minus seven LI over L star coming from the exo, uh, sorry, from our Kuiper belt. So this is the primary way that debris disks are detected around other stars because stars are faint in the far infrared. 
And so it's easy to distinguish emission that's coming from dust from emission coming from the photosphere. So let's just briefly talk a little bit more about the zodiacal light in terms of what it sets for our expectations about other debris disks. So the common size in the zodiacal light is about 150 microns. And we think that's because there are actually cometary bodies that are breaking up into fairly large chunks, which then grind themselves down to a certain extent. And it turns out that the spatial distribution of the dust in our solar system is most consistent with that of Jupiter family comets. So those are short period comets that originated in the Kuiper belt, interacted strongly with Jupiter and were sent into the inner part of the solar system. When they break apart, they'll leave dust that tracks the same orbital elements as they had themselves. So it appears that the asteroidal contribution to the zodiacal dust is actually quite small, less than 10%, and the same for comets that are coming from the Oort cloud. So the important thing here is that the balance of the different components of the zodiacal dust is due to the architecture of our planetary system. And so this is the primary characteristic of other disks that we'd like to tell us about the architectures of other planetary systems. If we can find out more about the composition of their dust and where it came from, it tells us something about how planet formation proceeded in those systems. Right? We don't have Jupiter family comet dust in our inner solar system because Jupiter family comets are the most massive and abundant things in our solar system. We have them because they're the ones that survive to deposit and are perturbed to deposit their dust in the vicinity of the Earth. So one reason we study debris disks is to understand how the history of planet formation progresses. So we know that our system must have started with a lot of gas because we have gas giant planets. And then after a certain time, there were giant impacts. So for example, the moon forming impact uh, that, uh, that occurred on Earth at about 100 million years and ongoing bombardment that we see as a cratering record on, for example, the moon or the Galilean satellites. Now we have very few planetesimals in our system, right? We have a mature planetary system. We think perhaps there was a giant instability that caused a lot of the asteroids and comets in our system to be cleared away. So we'd like to know whether this history is typical of planetary systems or whether there are other architectures that result in very different timelines and one way we can do that is by studying stars of different ages and looking at their disks as a function of time. So we're primarily concerned with time periods after 50 to 100 million years, analogous to the time when we had a gas-free and planetesimal dominated disk in the solar system. So finding other debris disks is, of course, a wonderful story. It started with serendipity, as, and so it makes a fun story to tell students about uh, the way that we do science. In 1983, the infrared astronomical satellite was launched and to do an all sky survey at wavelengths that are very hard to see from the ground, 12, 25, 60, and 100 microns. And Vega has long been used as a calibrator star and IRAS too intended to use it as a calibrator. And based on Vega's brightness at, at visible and near infrared wavelengths, we knew what its, wave, its flux should be at 12 to 100 microns. And at 12 microns, it was emitting about as expected, but at 25, 60 and 100 microns, it appeared to be emitting too much flux. And at first the IRS team thought something was wrong with the instrument, but happily nothing was wrong with the satellite. And they instead had made a great discovery, which is that there was dust around Vega absorbing light from the central star and re-emitting it in the infrared. And the fact that it peaks out at about 60 microns means that the dust around Vega has a characteristic temperature of about 60 Kelvin. Integrating all of the infrared flux, again, we can calculate that metric, the luminosity in the infrared compared to the luminosity of the star. And for Vega, that's about 10 to the minus five. So about 100 times more dusty than our zodiacal light or Kuiper belt dust. So I just wanted to point out that LIR over L star is proportional to the surface area of the dust. That would also be proportional to the mass if you know the density and size distribution of the dust. So very quickly, IRAS identified three other disks to go along with Vega. So these are the big four, Vega, Beta Pictoris, Epsilon, Eridani, and Fomalhaut. 
Eventually, it found around 100 debris disks around stars closer than about 300 parsecs. So IRAS did a full sky survey. So it was great at finding disks around nearby stars, but it wasn't that sensitive by today's standards. So today, the best census of disks come from pointed observations in volume limited surveys. So of course, what wavelength you look at shows what kind of disk that you can actually find. The Vega disk peaking out at about 60 microns is about 60 Kelvin. So far infrared missions are going to be best at finding these cold disks, analogous to the Kuiper belt, but much more massive. Mid infrared observations are going to be better at finding disks around the temperature of Earth, say a couple of hundred Kelvin, 300 Kelvin, and near infrared observations can find very hot disks. So the problem, of course, is that stars emit a lot more at short wavelengths. And so distinguishing the disk from the star becomes much more difficult if you're just measuring a total flux. And that's why near-infrared and mid-infrared observations resort to interferometry to find spatially resolved emission that you can definitely tell is a disk where you wouldn't be able to tell that small amount of emission plus the photosphere actually came from a disk. So most of our best surveys come at these longer wavelengths. And that results in the fact that most debris disks that we know about are cold. So our best pointed surveys have been from the Spitzer Space Telescope and the Herschel Space Telescope operating out at 60 or 100 microns. So they're very good at finding this cold dust. And you can see they can find uh, dust that has or disks that have very low luminosity, almost down to the level that we expect for the solar system, but at least down to 10 to the minus six LIR over L star. WISE did an all sky survey, so that's great for finding disks, but it's a small telescope and less sensitive. So while it finds disks that are temperatures of a couple of hundred Kelvin, it's generally limited to disks that have LIR over L star of something like 10 to the minus four. And then, as I said, you need interferometry to really find faint disks at zodiacal light temperatures around stars by actually spatially resolving them. And that's been the purpose of the Large Binocular Telescope Interferometer Hosts Survey, which I'll talk about a little bit later, to find more zodi-like disks. Now, of course, JWST is coming up. It's going to be super sensitive. It'll be great at finding disks, but it's hard to do a survey with JWST because you have to point at every star individually. So let's talk about the occurrence rates of disks that come from these various surveys. As I said, it's the cold debris disks that are known the best because we've had the most sensitive surveys um, out at far infrared wavelengths. And so together, Spitzer and Herschel studied several hundred AF, G, K, and M stars and found disks with a typical size of about 50 astronomical units. So overall, the statistics show that FGK stars, about 22% of those in the solar neighborhood have these cold infrared excesses with LAR over L stars greater than 10 to the minus six. And you can see the spectral type distribution here from the debris survey plus dune survey data of the Herschel Space Telescope. So that looked at 275 FGK stars in a volume limited sample. So you can see that the incidence rates are a little higher for early type stars, but they're definitely way higher for A, F, G, and K stars than they are for M stars. And so if you include M stars, the overall incidence rate goes down to below 20%, something like 17% um, for all nearby stars. So now if we look at occurrence rates of exozodiacal dust, where our best statistics come, as I said, from the Large Binocular Telescope Interferometer, you can see that, again, there are about 25% of nearby stars that are detected uh, with warm dust. So that's actually fairly similar to the 22% detected for cold disks. And maybe even more interesting, the cold dust is usually an indicator that there will be significant amounts of warm dust. So the purple bars here show uh, all stars divided into two different um, spectral type categories. So there's 10 out of 38 for all stars. Um, but if you look at stars that were already known to have cold dust, seven of the nine of those showed warm dust. Now there are some warm disks that don't have cold analogs, three out of 28. There actually seems to be a bimodal distribution of dust where some disks are really dusty and most stars don't have very much dust. 
So part of the point of doing a survey like this, by the way, is that the signal from a few zodies of dust exceeds the signal from an exo Earth around a star at 10 parsecs, even for a big telescope. And so how much noise those telescopes have to deal with depends on how much exozody they are. So that's exozody as noise. I'm interested in exozody as signal. Some number of stars are able to actually keep warm dust for a long time. There doesn't seem to be a correlation in the incidence of these exozodies with stellar age. Okay, and then finally, there are interferometers that work at shore wave wavelengths, particularly the Very Large Telescope Interferometer, its pioneer instrument, that have detected very hot disks around 15% of nearby main sequence stars. And so by hot, I mean temperatures more of like 1,000 Kelvin, so emitting at 1.6 or 2.2 microns. And the relationship between these very hot disk sources and the warm or cold disk sources is not well understood yet. So how exactly this dust gets there is unclear. Okay, so I mentioned that we expected in our solar system that the amount of dust would decrease with time as the amount of planetesimals decreased with time. And that is generally the trend that's seen in uh, those surveys for relatively cold excess at 24 and 60 microns. So warmer dust declines faster, so maybe disk removal processes are faster in the inner systems, but even cold dust declines, but then it gets fairly steady over the last um, several gig years of the time periods that are studied. And in particular, the exozody hot dust shows no correlation with age. So dust can last of, to solar age stars at levels that are much greater than that in the solar system. So we are talking about debris disks as signposts of planets. So you might ask, what exactly is the incidence of debris disks in systems that actually have planets? And there have been many uh, studies of that type and they can be classed into two categories. So one looks at the detected planets, either by transit or usually radial velocities, because they're looking at nearby, radial velocities are looking for nearby uh, stars, and asks, is there a higher incidence of disks around stars with radial velocity planets than around stars that don't have detected planets? And the answer seems to be there's no correlation. So you're equally likely to find a disk, and the mass of that disk is likely to be the same around uh, a star with a radial velocity planet or a star without one. So where you do see a relationship between planets and disks is when you look at wide giant planets. So those are the ones that are directly imaged and they are more common in systems with debris disks. So maybe it's not surprising that the radial velocity planets are uncorrelated with cold dust, which is out at many tens of AU and the radial velocity planets are within a few AU whereas giant planets that are actually imaged are at 10 to 1,000 AU themselves and five to 10 Jupiter masses. So they're both more massive and further out. And 6% of debris disks host a giant planet, uh, whereas only that are directly imaged, whereas only 0.7% of non-disk stars do. So there is a relationship of some sort between debris disks and planets. What we'd like to be able to do is to use disks to infer the presence of planets that we have not been able to directly image. So to do that, we think we have to turn to imaging where we can actually look at the structure of the disk in some detail. So when we image disks, and these are all images of, well, the three on the right are all images of disks in scattered light. On the left, you probably recognize that that is not a disk, but that nature gives us a particular point of view on disks. We can be observing them face on like the pizza at the top, or we can be observing them edge on like the dough at the bottom or at any range of inclinations in between. And we of course have to take what nature gives us. The disk doesn't have to be intrinsically circular. Even if it is, it will look elliptical if it's inclined to our line of sight. So particularly for scattered light observations, one has to disentangle the geometric effects from the intrinsic disk geometry. So the goal, remember, is to look at properties of the disk to find out if they've been sculpted by planets. So I will go through six different types of disk structures and how they may be related to planets using at least one disk in each case as an example, but I don't mean to imply that the disks that I'm gonna talk about are the only examples of each kind of structure. I really mean them only to be examples. Okay, so 
Disc morphology, what are the signposts of planets? Well, the number one that we have to talk about is a warp or a, a two, a one disc inclined to another disc in the same system. And the canonical example of this is Beta Pictoris. So Beta Pictoris is the disc that keeps on giving. It was one of those first four discovered by IRAS and pretty much every observational technique has been thrown at it in the intervening 40 years. So we know a lot about the disc, about beta Pic, and about its planets, of course, now. So this warp was first seen in the disc in the late 90s. The image that I'm showing you is one from the Hubble Space Telescope's disc instrument. So it's in the visible, and you're looking at scattered light. And by warp, we mean that there's an outer disc, and then there's an inner disc that seems to be inclined to it, or warped from the outer disc. So very early on, after the discovery of this warp, there was a prediction for what a planet could make. So Moya et al. in 1997 predicted that you could create that warp with a planet on an orbit with a semi-major axis of 1 to 20 astronomical units, an inclination to the main disk of 3 to 5 degrees, and a mass of something like a Jupiter mass, maybe a tenth of a Jupiter, a hundredth of a Jupiter mass to 10 Jupiter masses. So then, wonderfully, planets were actually discovered around Beta Pictoris. So using direct imaging, Lagrange et al. discovered Beta Pictoris B, uh, which is seen here in a composite image shown within the disk, but at two different times. So you see the disk, the planet is orbiting. And so here's where it was in 2003. Here's where it was in 2009. It's now back over on this side. And the properties of this planet, as recently determined by Brandt et al. using astrometry in addition to the data um, astrometry from direct imaging and radial velocity data, says that this planet has a semi-major axis of 10 AU, an inclination of about one degree, which is last note than the prediction, um, and a mass of about nine Jupiter masses. So this was a wonderful confirmation of the fact that debris disk structure could be used to infer the presence of planets. And of course, Moya et al. didn't want to stretch too far, so they put in one planet, but it turns out there's also a second planet, at least in the Beta Pic system, so Beta Pic C, which has a smaller semi-major axis, 2.7 AU, uh, uh, approximately the same inclination. It's uh, consistent with being coplanar with B and a mass of eight Jupiter masses. So this was a great evidence that you could actually use disk structure to predict the location of a planet. All right, our second type of morphology we might look for as a signpost of planets are cavities and rings. So cavities have to be cleared somehow, right? They're 10, uh, pointing Robertson drag tends to drag um, objects in and the disks that have rings with central cleared cavities could be because there are planets inside them. And we have another great example of this in HR 8799. Of course, the four planets have been imaged in the system and they sit inside a debris disk that is cold. And um, it may even be that the inner edge of that system is far enough out that it leaves room at least for a fifth planet, if not actually requiring a fifth planet. So the fact that this disk is puffy and has a inner edge, which is not extremely sharp, indicates that there's probably some eccentricity to the planetesimals that are generating the dust. And so that is a measurement that has to be reconciled with the orbits of the planets to look at the stability of the system. And so as more and more of these ringed disks are observed, on the right, I'm showing another example from Sphere data, uh, HD117214 from a paper last year, that you can calculate how many planets and of what mass you would need to clear a cavity of the size that you observe. And so for example, in this paper, Engler et al. calculated that they would need 30 planets to clear this 40 AU cavity. So I don't think anyone is quite willing to go as far as saying that they can predict something as precisely as the beta pic B planet, but it does seem like centrally cleared cavities are a feature of debris disks. And as you get to older ages where you would have expect that, expected that inner dust to clear faster, that becomes a stronger and stronger indication that there might be something in there doing the clearing. For the very young systems, I would say it's not um, a smoking gun yet, because it's possible that you are just having planet 
formation progress outward and you're mostly eating up your planetesimals in the process of planet formation. All right, our next uh, aspect of disk morphology is eccentricity. And as we get better and better images of, for example, ringed disks, we can measure that they are offset from their central stars. And usually that's also associated with one side of the disk being a little bit brighter than the other, uh, which is attributed to the fact that the planetesimals are in eccentric orbits and releasing their dust in eccentric orbits. So an example of this is the Fummelhaut disk here seen in its uh, submillimeter images from ALMA. And Fummelhaut's eccentricity is about 0.13. So that's a substantial eccentricity, and it's not dissimilar from eccentricity seen in other systems. Um, there are also lower eccentricities. And that enables you to predict where a planet might be that's forcing those planetesimals into that eccentricity. And so you can see what uh, the radius of the disk to the radius of the planet um, might look like. So Fummelhaut looked like it was going to be another of these great examples where a disk eccentricity could lead to a prediction of a planet and then that planet could be actually observed. Unfortunately, um, as you probably heard, the Fummelhaut planet actually seemed to be something, again, which is pretty interesting, which is a dust clump that then disintegrated. So here's the scattered light image of the Fummelhaut disk. The so-called planet was observed over here. And over time, you can see that the images show that this object seems to spread out and get weaker. And so it really seems to be a disintegrating dust clump. Now, a dust clump like this probably had to be generated in the collision of two pretty big planetesimals. And so it's still an open question what planets might be in the Fummelhaut system, both to generate the eccentricity, but also to cause planetesimals to be on intersecting orbits where they would collide and actually produce a dust clump like this. But this is also a pretty cool example of the process that we think generates the dust and debris disks, and that is the collision of actual uh, secondary bodies. Okay, the next aspect of disk morphology would be gaps or double belts. So rather than cleared central cavities here, I'm talking about having structure within the disk. And an interesting example, two interesting examples are given here, HD 15115, these are ALMA images, um, where you can see there seems to be a gap between an inner disk and an outer disk. Another really recent example is an even younger star, HD 131835, that has maybe spirals or multiple rings um, within the main ring. So the idea would be that you have a planet within the gap that's clearing the material in its neighborhood, it's massive enough to open that gap, but not massive enough to totally have disrupted the disk in the lifetimes of these systems, which are relatively young, right? 20 million years. All right, our fifth disk morphology is a brightness asymmetry or wings. And the classic example of this um, is HG 61005, known as the moth, and HG 32297 is kind of like the moth junior. So you can sort of see why this is called the moth phenomenon that looks like there are wings from this disk. I, I actually think it should be the Babylon 5 phenomenon because you can actually see there are multiple extents for the dust here. There's not just one tilted uh, wing, there's actually a second tilted wing there. In any case, um, what is causing these moth-like asymmetries? Well, one idea was that this is actually an interaction with gas in the interstellar medium. So a disk that's not extended blows through a part of the interstellar medium that's a little bit over dense. That interstellar medium sandblasts small grains out of the disk and causes them to form this wing-like shape at the end. So that could be confirmed if you could actually find the interstellar medium that was doing that, but usually the interstellar medium is actually sufficient, sufficiently sparse that it's difficult to do that. But another way that you can make these wings is if you force planetesimals into eccentric but aligned orbits. So this is what the system would look like if it were face on. You have a planet, of course, that's doing the forcing, 
And then you tilt that sideways and you can see something that has wings. And now there's a third hypothesis in a paper by Lin and Chang a couple of years ago that says that if you have gas in the disk, the gas drag substantially alters the orbits of the dust. And after accounting for the scattering phase function, you can get um, a distribution of dust that looks like that, which is observed. So these hypotheses are tested by comparing the optical images of the dust because the scattered light images look at the small dust grains and it's the small dust grains that are affected by the interstellar medium drag. And you can compare those to the submillimeter images because the submillimeter images look at the large grains which are not pushed around by interstellar medium or radiation pressure and more closely track the locations of the planetesimals that generated them. And you can look at gas in these disks and try to figure out whether there's the appropriate amount of gas to be doing the gas drag. So here are two examples of those moths, 61005 and HD 32297. And in both cases, the ALMA data reveal extended uh, emission. So grains that are not just in the same distribution that are seen in a lot of debris disks, a very tight ring, but actually continue out in the direction that uh, the scattered light does. And in the case of 32297, there is even a few sigma evidence for extra dust in the direction of the wing. And so almost suggests that it's not, at least not just the interstellar medium that's creating these uh, structures because the large grains also seem to follow in the direction of the wings. Furthermore, these two stars provide a really interesting comparison because they have very different gas properties. So HD 6105 is gas free and HD 32297 actually has so much gas that Lin and Chang said that it might be too much gas for their uh, method of producing the wings to work well. So I would say at this point, while the jury is still open on what causes these disks with wings, it's tending in the direction of planets and away from the interstellar medium or gas. Okay, our last disk morphology aspect to talk about is the presence of warm and cold dust. So I mentioned that the Large Binocular Telescope Interferometer found that 70% of uh, warm disks were found in uh, disks that were cold. So the example that I'd like to show you is of Beta Leo. These are observations made with the Large Binocular Telescope Interferometer. And they show that there is a rising amount of infrared excess in the central part of the system. And if you model the entire spectral energy distribution, Beta Leo has a well-known outer disk but you need a, the addition of an inner belt of planetesimals at something like 5 AU. And it's not sufficient to just drag in dust from the outer system in order to get the amount of the excess that's seen in the inner system. So there would have to be a recent collision or a secondary belt of dust to explain the warm dust. So this is, um, an interesting question of how this warm dust gets there. If there's a recent collision, maybe it's because a planet is perturbing the outer disk and allowing a lot of material to flow into the center. Or maybe this is analogous to one of those gapped disks like what we talked about before, where there's a planet that has eaten or multiple planets which have eaten the material between an inner asteroid belt and an outer cold belt. Okay, so that concludes part two where I've shown you six different ways that we can use dust morphology to try to understand whether there are planets in a system. So now I'm going to part three of my talk where I wanna talk about a few other topics of, these are important observations I think of disks that are related to planet formation and composition. So they may not be directly signposts like the morphologies that we talked about, but I think they're really important to understanding the architectures of planetary systems. So the first topic is that there is gas in debris disks. So debris disks are gas poor, but they're not gas free. So to date, there've been about 20 detections of gas, mostly in the form of carbon monoxide and mostly from carbon monoxide emission as observed by the ALMA telescope. 
So a few of these discs could have primordial gas. Remember I said at the beginning that it's difficult to distinguish whether some material has lasted from a primordial stage at the same time that secondary material has been generated. But generally these have much lower gas to dust ratios than are expected in say the interstellar medium or in a primordial disk. They're also mostly so far detected around A and F stars, although there are a couple of G stars and an M star uh, that show gas. And the question is, what is the origin of this gas and what does it tell us about the architectures of these systems? Well, from studies of the fact that the gas and the dust seem to be co-located, the primary hypothesis is that the gas is generated from exocomets, that is volatile rich uh, bodies that are disintegrating to produce both gas and dust. So if the gas and dust are released from the same source, and we expect them to have approximately the same spatial distribution. Although, of course, the gas and the dust are subject to somewhat different forces after release, and so they might not have identical distributions. So this is basically what we see. Again, in beta pictoris, you can see there's an asymmetry in the continuum emission seen with ALMA. So this side of the disk is somewhat brighter than this side. And now if you look at the gas as observed, this is CO gas observed by ALMA, it's also located on the side of the disk that is brighter in the continuum. And so this is thought to be some sort of massive collision that has reduced both gas and dust. In HD 32297, that winged disk that we were talking about a couple minutes ago, this shows the continuum emission and the gas. And again, they are exactly co-located. And in HD 181327, which is a ringed disk, again, um, the dust continuum comes from this ring and the gas is almost exactly co-located with it. So there are indications of much more complicated things going on with the gas and disks, a couple of those complications I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, but I would say the indication is that the gas and the dust are produced from the same source. Some of these though, those sources have to be incredibly abundant, like a big comet releasing dust and gas every few minutes. So in addition to the CO that is now observed um, in emission with ALMA, there's also been really interesting observations of atomic gas in disks. So again, this started with beta pictoris. So these are all in fact data from beta pictoris. This is what I just showed you on the previous slide. Here is sodium, atomic sodium emission following Keplerian rotation in the disk from a paper by Alexis Brandecker in 2004. So you might immediately think, well, the disk is in Keplerian rotation, that makes sense. But the problem is that, that atoms like sodium should feel extremely strong radiation pressure from the central star. And they should be being blown out by tens to hundreds of kilometers per second not sitting in low velocity Keplerian rotation around the central star. We know that the disk around Beta Pictoris is optically thin to the ultraviolet of the central star and the invisible of the central star, and sodium absorbs very strongly in the visible. So this has been a puzzle for a long time, and we think that it was largely resolved with theory, so I'm not gonna to talk too much about the theory, that says that if you can form a disk of ionized carbon, Ionized carbon doesn't feel radiation pressure very strongly because its transitions don't overlap where the, any place where the star is luminous, then that ionized carbon can form a Coulomb disk, which then breaks itself and any other species which are tied to it. So it's the electrostatic forces that actually are working against the radiation pressure. And sure enough, observations of the disk, because it's perfectly edge on, you can look at the absorption of atomic gas in the disk against the central star as the light bulb. And in particular, in the ultraviolet, there are transitions of oxygen and carbon, as well as a lot of other atomic transitions in the optical and the, and the ultraviolet. Because beta pic produces some ultraviolet emission lines in the right places, you can actually see the absorption of atomic carbon uh, ionized carbon against those emission lines and oxygen. And so you can actually form an entire inventory of the gas in the disk and show that it looks more like secondary material than primary material. Um, but this also helps to explain the puzzle of the radiation pressure, uh, lack of radiation pressure winds, um, because that carbon overabundance um, stabilizes the disk. 
So there's all kinds of interesting gas physics that affects the interpretation of the dynamics and the composition of these disks and probably affects those morphologies as well. So we need to cycle back and think about those. So the other interesting thing about gas is that CO should quickly dissociate to atomic gas. And so the source of that carbon that you just saw in beta pic should be the dissociation of CO by interstellar and stellar ultraviolet. And that time scale for the dissociation of CO is extremely short, like 300 years. So you should quickly build up carbon in the disk. And the puzzling thing is that some disks show that buildup of carbon and some really don't. And some show quite different spatial distributions of the CO and the carbon, which should be generated from it. So this is the case of 49 SETI, in which there were the observations of emission lines in the far infrared from carbon. Also absorption, because it's edge on, absorption lines um, due to oxygen and also carbon and, and a half a dozen other elements. But oddly, even though there's lots of CO emission, in fact, this was one of the first debris disks back in the, in the mid 90s by Ben Zuckerman to have been found with CO emission, it has no CO seen in absorption along the line of sight. So there's some interesting distribution of the carbon generated from the CO and the CO itself. There's also possibly some grain interactions and gas dynamics. Uh, there's the lifetimes of all these species to take into account. I think that gas studies for disks are really um, exciting and there'll be a lot of really interesting data coming on these disks in the coming years. All right, the second aspect of uh, disks that I wanted to talk about from a formation and composition standpoint are the extreme debris disks and sometimes also thought of as the extreme warm debris disks. So these disks have large fractional luminosities. Remember I said that the faintest disks that say the Herschel and Spitzer surveys found were like 10 to the minus six in LIR over L star. Well, these extreme disks have 1% LIR over L star 0.01. So that's one sense in which they're extreme. The other sense in which they're extreme is that the dust is warm, usually 300 to 600 Kelvin. And that of course is unlike the vast majority of the cold disks that have been found. And the other thing that makes them extreme is that they're often found around old stars, stars older than 100, 200 million years, and even a couple of stars older than a gig year. So I think the poster child for these extreme warm disks is BD plus 2307. It shows some of the characteristics that are pretty much universal. Um, first of all, it's extreme infrared luminosity. But second of all, the fact that most of its dust is in small dust grains and is emitting very strongly in these silicate emission features. So these uh, 10 micron and 20 micron peaks are characteristic of one micron silicates. And that it has very little cold dust, only an upper limit out here at 160 microns with Spitzer. It shares another aspect with a lot of these extreme disks, which is that it's a binary star and that um, is a spectroscopic binary was well known, but uh, recently a white dwarf companion was also discovered. So I'll come back to talking about that in just a moment. The other feature that these extreme disks seem to share is that they're variable. So 14 of the 17 known extreme disks are variable. And here are two great examples of that variability from two other really well-known um, extreme disks that Kate Sue has worked on. So IDH shows this tremendous drop and then rise and flux, um, perhaps in a semi-periodic way um, that may indicate that there was a large collision and the products of that collision are coming back and colliding again in subsequent orbits. Uh, here's another example where the excess fraction dropped from 50% down to 20% over the course of a few years. So it's quite common for these uh, sources to have variability. That's true for BD plus 2307 too, although it's not nearly as variable as these. So I mentioned that um, binaries are common. Eight out of 15 of the ones uh, that have been well studied are, well, are wide binaries of these extreme disks. And even more interestingly, eight out of the 10 old ones, the ones that are older than 100 million years are binaries. So while 80% of the extreme disks are binaries, only 13% of mean sequence stars are binaries with similar separations. So binarity seems to have something to do with the, the production of this warm dust and the variability. So it might be that there's a Kozai-Lidov 
interaction and you're pumping up the eccentricity of the companion and it's coming in and destabilizing a planetary system or a cometary system and generating a lot of collisions. Um, anyway, it tells us something interesting, I think, about the probability that systems wind up with massive Kuiper belts capable of generating such large amounts of dust at late times, and also something really interesting about the dynamics of binary systems. So the other reason that I think these extreme disks can be really interesting is that they help us understand the frequency of extreme systems or giant impacts. So perhaps leaving aside the binary question for a moment, you could say that if you can observe the fraction of hot dust stars, so that you go out and count how many of these hot dust stars are there in a given sample. So for example, in the Moore et al. sample recently, they found eight out of a sample of about 79,000 stars. Well, that should be proportional to the number of giant impacts or events of some kind that are generating the dust um, times the ratio of the lifetime of those collision products to the ages of the stars. So this is veering on theory for the lifetime of the collision products. Um, but let's assume the lifetime of the collision products is something like 10 to the five years. And then we could calculate the number of giant impacts or extreme events per star. And it turns out that's a pretty large number, 0.2. And that means that whatever this phenomenon is that is generating these um, extreme disks doesn't really look that uncommon. All right, the final aspect of um, planet formation that I wanted to talk about um, that involves debris disks is disk composition. So this is actually near and dear to my heart because while it's true that disks are signposts of planets, there are also the remnants of planet formation. And just as we study the comets and asteroids in our system to understand what the primordial material out of which our planets formed was, we also study the material around other stars to find out what their planets could be made out of. And there are a lot of different ways that we can study disk composition. I am not going to talk about them in any detail and some I've already touched on, but I at least wanted to mention them here. So because debris disks are largely cold, they generally don't have these extreme silicate features that I pointed out in the extreme disks. This is another example of an extreme disk. So when there are these warm silicate features, we can use them to directly detect the silicate composition of the dust. Um, but these things aren't available for the vast majority of cold debris disks. So more typically, what we're able to see from cold debris disks is the amount of scattered light as a function of wavelength or a spectrum of the scattered light. And we can do that in a spatially resolved sense. So this is an example from AUMIC with a paper we have on Astro pH, where you can then fit the spectrum of the dust with a model dust grain that we think has, say, the shape and size and different compositions that would be um, expected for disks, and we can derive a composition or retrieve a composition from our best fits to the spectra. The scattered light gives um, information about the albedo as a function of wavelength. The scattered light composition uh, depends on um, both the albedo, the phase function, and also the polarization fraction. And so very recently, the large telescopes have been able to do imaging in polarized and unpolarized light and actually calculate linear, linear polarization fractions, which are a good indication of composition. We can, of course, also look at the gas. I, measured, I mentioned you can tally up all the atomic gas in a disk. This is the example for beta pictoris and compare it to what you expect for stars, uh, chondrites, and comets. And you can also image that gas. This is an example of imaging um, carbon in the HD32297 disk and try to understand how uh, the planetesimals that generate it are what their composition is in terms of carbon, um, CO, and oxygen. So I think that all of these different observations of disk composition have the potential to tell us about whether the compositions of rocky planets in the system should they be discovered are similar or not to the rocky planet compositions in our system. And finally, I wanted to mention M stars. Um, we know that small planets are common around M stars, but disks are rare. And 
three of the four disks that have been imaged around M stars are around very young stars, two in the TW Hydra Association, which is only about 10 million years old, and AU MIC, uh, which I mentioned earlier, which is only about 20 million years old. And M stars are a puzzle. So why they have so little dust is a bit of a puzzle, and it verges on theory. So I'm not going to talk too much about it right now, but it may have to do with the fact that they're so active and have stellar winds. But I also wanted to give a cautionary tale on M stars when we go searching for disks around them, because we really would like to find more and find out what the relationship between debris disks and all these low mass planetary systems are that are found around M stars. So these are all my images of the AUMIC disk. And you can see that there's a fair amount of emission from the center from the location of the star. So that could be warm dust in a zodiacal-like cloud, which would be really exciting. And as you may know, now AUMEC has at least one and possibly two transiting planets discovered around it. So this would be a great case for studying the interaction of low mass planets and dust. Um, but the other option, right, is that the star is emitting, although we don't think that stars normally put out 1.3 millimeter emission. So here's a spectral energy distribution of the dust in the system. And uh, here's the measurement of the star substantially above what you would predict for a stellar photosphere. And sure enough, Meredith McGregor found that AUMIC flares in the millimeter. And it flares, it was a well-known flare star at, at visible and ultraviolet wavelengths, but it flares more than 1% of the time at submillimeter wavelengths. So probably all of that a uh, hot emission that was seen in the ALMA image is from the flare and not from a very copious exozoti around AUMEC. It's exactly the same story for Proxima Sen, where a few years ago, uh, authors found emission at the location of Proxima Sen and found that they could connect the dots for a mission further away from the star and thought maybe they had discovered two or three disks around Proxima Sen. But it's exactly the same story for Proxima Sen. Most of the time, there's no emission coming from the star. And then um, every so often, you see an incredibly bright flare. And that's for a star that, you know, AUMIC is young and a known flare star. Proxima is old and a not particularly active star and it still produces a lot of emission. So it's not just that disks are rare around M stars, it's also that they're very difficult to find and come with um, the need for caution. Okay, so let me conclude. Um, debris disks, I hope you find them as fascinating as I do. They may be as common as planets, found around at least 20% of stars. We mainly detect the bright ones, so presumably there are many more that are at the level of the solar system out there still to find. Debris disk structure hints and sometimes screams at the presence of planets. So we think that uh, all of those different warps, rings, holes, wings uh, might also all be um, the result of having planets in the system as well as planetesimals. But importantly, planets and disks evolve together to form a mature planetary system. So while they're signposts of planetary systems, it's also that their compositions and evolutions have a lot to tell us about the origins of planetary systems and the types of paths that they follow during their evolution. So I thank you very much for sticking with me to the end, and I look forward to interacting with you in person during the conference.